As they're making their way out, I'm going to encourage you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're beginning a series this morning entitled Basic Discipleship. For the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at basic discipleship. What does discipleship look like? And there are a lot of words in church we throw around. We don't really know exactly what they mean, but we, we like the way they sound. Things like justification and sanctification and predestination. Words like sin and justice, mercy and grace. You throw out words like Yahweh and Jehovah and Adonai. And, and you have all of these words that, boy, they sound really good to us when we speak them. But we really don't quite have a grasp on what they mean. Discipleship, I'm afraid, is one of those words. How many of you all would agree this morning, discipleship is an important part of a church? Agreed? How many of you all can tell me this morning what discipleship is? Good, that's why we're doing this series. One or two, maybe. What is discipleship? Uh, we, we know that we're supposed to be a disciple. We know we're supposed to disciple others and make disciples, but... We don't really understand tangibly what that means. I want to begin by reading, and you can follow along on the screen, a verse from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19. And it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So there's our command. Go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples. And so our question is, if this is the command that Jesus leaves us, this is the last thing he tells us to do before we, we are embarking on building his church. This is his last commandment before he ascends into heaven. What does discipleship look like? We know we're supposed to be a disciple, but we don't even know what a disciple is. Are we supposed to learn? Are we supposed to teach? Are we supposed to do something? Are we supposed to wait? Are we supposed to be something? What, what is a disciple? And the truth is, being a disciple is intimidating because we have no idea tangibly what it looks like. And so this series, I want you to constantly be asking this question. Who am I discipling and who is discipling me? Kenzie, I'm going to phone so I get less feedback, okay? So constantly we're asking the question, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? me. I don't know that you've ever approached your faith quite in that manner, but I think these are important questions to be asking. If every believer is to be a disciple and every believer is supposed to disciple someone, we constantly should have someone discipling us and we constantly should be discipling someone else. Before we get into our message this morning, which is entitled An Example of Discipleship, where we're just going to look at one place in Scripture, I want to kind of lay out the model of discipleship for you. In the next few weeks, we'll expand on this, but I want to be very clear on what we are called to do as a disciple. First, I hope we realize the essential qualities of a disciple, that it is a commandment in Scripture. That it is not a suggestion, but we are called to be disciples. Do you realize that our entire church should, in theory, be built on disciples? Not just on Christians. As a matter of fact, Christians were called disciples long before they were called Christians. You are to be a disciple. And so we need to know, what does a disciple look like? And, and what am I supposed to do as a discipler? Now, how many of you in here say, I am ready to take someone under my wing and disciple them this Sunday morning? Anybody say, I'm ready to do that right here and right now? One hand, two hands, one of them's under the age of, of 10, so I don't know how we'll go with that. Um, it, it's difficult, right? We, we have to reach a certain level, we believe. If I'm going to disciple someone, I have to be up here. This morning, I want to be very clear. We tend to think of a discipleship relationship as primarily vertical. There's the discipler and the disciplee. Up here is the person who knows, and down here is the person who is learning. And so the hope is that the person learning is growing to a point where they'll be able to then be equal with the teacher, and maybe even the student will become the teacher and start discipling others. And when we have a view of discipleship that way, we, we will never feel adequate to be a disciple or to disciple someone else. I believe discipleship is much more horizontal in nature. Two Christians coming together saying, I need to grow in my faith. 
You need to grow in your faith. How can we grow in our faith together? What can I learn from you and what can you learn from me? So instead of having to reach a certain level to disciple someone, we're right where we're at in our Christian faith, ready to sit down, meet with someone else, and as Scripture puts it, let iron sharpen iron and grow each other in the faith. Now, there will be times when you are spiritually more mature than someone else, and they come under your wing, and you teach them. There'll be other times that you're spiritually less mature, and you'll come under their wing, and they'll teach you. But if we're waiting for that father-son relationship, that teacher-student relationship to happen, we'll never fully understand what Jesus commands us when he says, go and make disciples. This morning, you are called to be a disciple maker. Whether you've been a Christian for five minutes, five years, or five decades, the command is for you to go and make disciples. And so we are constantly going to ask ourselves the question, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? I don't anticipate that right here this morning you have a, a full grasp and understanding of of who you're discipling or, or who's discipling you. I don't imagine that a name will pop into your mind at this very moment, but my hope and my prayer is that over the next three weeks, as we look at basic discipleship, you would start answering that question with a specific person or group of people. These are the individuals that I'm investing in, and these are the people that are investing in me. This morning, we, we realize that there are a ton of examples of discipleship in Scripture starting with the Gospels, where the 12 disciples came under Jesus Christ and learned from him. They were also called apostles, by the way. You realize the importance of them being called apostles and not just disciples. We, we get the idea that a disciple is a learner and we're learning, but an apostle means to be sent out. So these disciples were also disciplers to go out and reach other people as well. We see examples of discipleship all throughout the New Testament where in the book of Acts, both Peter and John and then later Paul are going from town to town to village to village, city to city, leading people to Christ. And in Paul's case, often staying there for years to help teach them and grow them in their faith so that they can then reach out to others. We see an example in a person named Timothy who was discipled not only by his mother and grandmother, but later came under Paul's wings specifically, and Paul taught him and trained him how to be an evangelist, a pastor, a preacher. We see examples of this all throughout Scripture, and this morning I want to look at just one in particular in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7-12. through 12. This is one of the examples of Paul going into a city, a city called Thessalonica, planting a church, leading people to Christ, and discipling them. And so we're going to see some principles this morning on what it looks like, this discipleship relationship, this, this relationship back and forth between Paul and the people of Thessalonica. Read with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 7. It says, Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead we were gentle among you as nursing mother nurtures her own children. We cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preach the gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteous, uh, how devoutly, righteously, and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Here Paul is writing a letter to the church of Thessalonica, and in doing so he lays out the relationship he has with the people there. Here's what it looked like when I was in your presence. Here's what it looked like when I was investing in you. This is Paul's example of discipleship with the people of Thessalonica. And so we, we're looking and seeing what principles we can find, how we are to relate to people as a discipler and as a disciplee as a disciple ourselves. How are we to have this relationship with others? What does it look like? And this is just one of many examples. And I think there are four ways that Paul related to the people of Thessalonica that are essential, essential as we study what a disciple 
is. First, we see that Paul related as a nurturer. Paul related as a nurturer. He cared and he invested in other people. He saw when they were hurting and he came alongside to to show love. If there was a tangible need, he was there to meet their tangible need. He wanted what was best for the people of Thessalonica and it showed. As a matter of fact, he says in verse 7 that he related as a mother. Although we could have been a burden as Christ's apostles, instead, he says, we were gentle among you as a nursing mother nurtures her own children. Men and women of the church both, you are called to be motherly in your discipleship relationships. You are called to to meet the needs of your disciple. An important and key aspect of building a relationship is having a genuine love and a nurturing relationship with another person. And the analogy here is, Paul says, like a nursing mother, we were nurturing you. This imagery is very clear to us even today. What does a nursing mother do for her her baby? What does a nursing mother provide for that child? And the answer is everything that that child could possibly need. That child needs fed. The mother is there. That child needs rest. The mother is there. That child needs interaction and, and stimulation. That mother is there. That child has any need whatsoever. The mother is there. That that child needs a diaper change, and the mother is there to go and get the father to help out with the diaper change. The point of it is this. Paul says, just like a mother has met every need for her child, I'm investing in you. I'm caring for you. Something else unique, and and there is a reason why I say men and women, you are called to be motherly. It is while fathers, and, and I'm a little biased here, are incredibly important to the family unit. A nursing mother provides something for her baby that a father cannot. A nursing mother can feed that child with her own body, whereas men, you cannot do that. There's this understanding that in this discipleship relationship, you're going to teach someone something that they could not learn from anyone else. Your unique experiences, your unique growth, and your unique faith is going to invest in other people in a way that someone else cannot do. And Paul says, just as a mother nurses her child, we nurtured you, we cared for you, and we provided for you. Paul related as a nurturer. When you're looking and asking the question, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? Be asking yourself, who can I invest in? Who can I nurture and care for and love? Or maybe going the other way, who is investing in me? Who is caring for me and loving on me. Secondly, we see that Paul related as a friend, as a companion, as someone who could come alongside. This is where we see the horizontal nature of discipleship as opposed to the vertical. Paul could have very easily said, I'm the nurturer, I have more than you have, I'm a giant in the faith and you are no one. And so come and do everything that I'm telling you to do. But we see Paul gets down on their level and says we're companions and co Labors. Look with me in verse 8 again. It says, We cared for you so much that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Paul says, Our lives were equal. We shared lives together. I worked and I labored among you. I built tents in your presence. I had a business while I was there in Thessalonica, and, and I worked just like you worked. We, we met together and we talked. We had breakfast together and lunch together and dinner together. We, we invested in each other like a friend to another. And we were pleased to share our own lives. You know, when we have a vertical understanding of discipleship, we don't get involved in other people's lives. It's a teaching time. You come and you learn from me, then go home and figure it out. Discipleship says, no, we're going to do this together. And so we'll have a teaching time, yes, but then we're just going to go out and and we're just going to have a meal together. Discipleship, when we're relating as a friend, says we're we're just going to go spend time together. There'll be times when we go out and we, we just hang out without any teaching whatsoever. It's just one friend to another. You know, the thing about friendship, it builds off this nurturing idea, is that there's this great love and this care. Paul says, you became dear to us. You know, some of the best disciples 
are, are born out of a loving friendship relationship. A neighbor who you already know pretty well. A, a co-worker who you enjoy spending time with, that you become companions with and friends with. And this loving relationship naturally evolves into this discipleship relationship. I think it's important when Paul has cared so much for these people that the first thing he did as he's sharing life with them is to share the gospel of God. We were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, first and foremost the gospel of God, most importantly the gospel that Jesus Christ saves, the very first step in discipleship being reaching out and evangelism. We were pleased because we cared so much about you to talk to you about Christ. He says, not only that, to invest in your lives, to become your friend, and to be close. Paul related to the people of Thessalonica as a friend, as a companion. So as we're asking ourselves a question, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? I think the, the first place you go is say, who do I already have a relationship with? Who are some of my friends that we can invest in? Who needs to know the gospel and I care so much about them that, that I want to lead them to Christ and share with them about Christ so that we can have this growing relationship together? Who is in my life already that I have companionship with? Thirdly, we see Paul related as a role model. He was someone to look up to. He was someone that, that would be in the midst of the people and they would say, I want to be like Paul. I want to do what he does. Elsewhere in Paul's letters, he writes, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, I, I am a role model among the people of Thessalonica. And he, he says just as much in verses 9 and 10. He says, you remember our labor and our hardship, brothers, how hard we worked, working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we preach God's gospel to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devoutly, righteously and blamelessly we conducted ourselves with you believers paul says remember when i was there remember what i did remember how i lived how hard i worked among you how i set the stage for how we are to be investing in people remember how devoutly righteously and blamelessly we were how we live lives that were above reproach so that when people looked at us they didn't find sin in our lives you know, this is the hardest part of being a disciple, and this is where I lose people when I call them to discipleship. Because our lives are full of sin and are a mess, and we don't feel worthy to invest in somebody else. Oh, nobody's looking up to us. Nobody cares about us. Nobody cares how we live or what we do. We're not an example to anyone. We don't teach, and we're, we're not in leadership. We, we just kind of are a follower. We, we just want to be... And so how am I to be a disciple like Paul was a disciple? And this is where that vertical idea creeps back in. Let me tell you this morning, we need to squash that vertical idea of discipleship. Because being a role model does not mean being perfect. If so, there is only one person who's ever lived who is worthy to disciple anyone. And that, that man has died 2,000 years ago. Thank the Lord he's come back to life. But Jesus Christ is not one-on-one -on -one discipling us today. He says, you go and make disciples, you sinful people. Those of you who constantly struggle with, with sin, you go and make disciples. You do what I've done. You be the role model. And so this aspect of discipleship, as Paul relates as a role model, is a call for us to get our act together. It's a call for us not to be okay with the sin in our life. It's a call for us to look and say, am I able to disciple someone or am I flippantly living my life not caring about the sin? Maybe it's a secret sin you struggle with. Something nobody else knows about and you feel unworthy and inadequate. You feel like you could not possibly invest in someone else because of the struggles you have. And it's a call for us to say, even though nobody else knows, I want to be an upstanding role model and battle that sin. Maybe it's something public. Maybe it's something that you're afraid people are talking about and everyone is, is sharing and secrets are going back and forth and you think people already know the sin I'm in. How can I invest in someone else? It's a time for you to, to very publicly denounce your sin and live a righteous life for Christ. Paul related as a role model saying, it, it doesn't matter what you think about me. I'm living my life righteously. I'm living my life devoutly and I'm living my life blamelessly to the best of my ability 
And just as a friend would, I'm going to admit when I fall short in my discipleship relationship. And I'm going to be a role model in seeking forgiveness. When we start to ask ourselves, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? We have to ask ourselves a question. Am I the role model that God's called me to be? Am I living according to the word of God? Am I fighting sin with all of my might? Asking God to forgive me and begging that he would, he would release me. And am I looking up to those who I have great respect for? Getting advice and asking for help as a role model in a discipleship relationship would. And finally, we see that Paul related as an encourager. He was someone in the corner of the people of Thessalonica. He was their supporter. He wanted them to know that he cared about them and he nurtured them. He was their friend. He was a role model. But if anything else, he wanted to come alongside and say, you can do this. You are able to live this Christian life. Look with me in verse 12, uh, 11 and 12. As you know, like a father with his own children, we encouraged, comforted, and implored each one of you to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul spent time simply imploring the people, encouraging the people, comforting them to walk in a godly manner. I imagine a lot of the time Paul spent with the people of Thessalonica and the new Christians was saying, I know you have sin in your life, but you can overcome this. Christ has overcome this on the cross. You don't have to stress so much about working things out. You are forgiven. You, you have overcome and you are conquerors. Paul spent a lot of his time just giving comfort to the people of Thessalonica. Like a father does to his own children. Uh, like a, a dad would with a, a son playing baseball. It's okay, son, you missed that one, you'll get the next one. It's okay that, that you missed that pop fly, we'll do it again. And I'll teach you and I'll guide you and we'll do this together. I know you have it in you. It's this idea that, that Paul says, I have full faith in you even when you don't have faith in yourself. A discipleship relationship is one that is encouraging. And Paul related as an encourager, saying... I, I will invest in you and I will encourage you to live the life you're called to live. When we ask ourselves a question, who am I discipling and who is discipling me? We ask ourselves, are we being encouraging to other individuals? Are, are we promoting their faith and, and sharing with them that we have confidence that the God who saved them will complete the work in their life and will help them and guide them? As we're asking the question, can I be a discipler? We have to ask ourselves, can I be an encourager? This is just one of many examples of discipleship in Scripture. And certainly there are other aspects to being a disciple, but I think this is a pretty good foundation for what it looks like. And honestly, I feel like it's less intimidating than when we just threw out the word disciple. You're called to nurture and care for people. You're called to be a companion and love them. Talk to them about the gospel as a friend. You are called to be a role model and live a godly life to the best of your ability. And you're called to be an encourager, to spur people on in their faith. When we think of discipleship in that way, it seems pretty simple, doesn't it? The, the basics of being a disciple is this. Leading someone to Christ and then helping them grow so they can lead someone else to Christ. So that the two of you can go and lead someone else to Christ and then teach them how to lead someone else to Christ. In the coming weeks, we're going to show how the biblical model of discipleship can reach every person on the planet with the gospel message of salvation. All seven and a half, eight billion people can be reached simply by putting this biblical model of discipleship in place. I'm excited to share that with you in the coming weeks, but for, for today, I want to be more concerned about our own lives. Are you a disciple? Are you being discipled? Are you discipling someone else? Are you using these principles we find in, in 1 Thessalonians as a means to invest in other people and allow other people to invest in us? The first step, as Paul points out in being a disciple, is, is knowing God's gospel, the gospel of salvation. So this morning, I would implore you to ask yourself, can I even be a disciple? Do I even have a relationship with Christ? This morning, I want you to know that, that during our song of invitation, you're invited to come and, and talk to me about how you can know without 
a doubt that Jesus Christ is your Savior and that you can be a disciple. Or maybe right here, right now, you need to start praying, Lord, I'm a believer, but I, I need to know who I'm going to disciple and who's going to disciple me. I need to start looking for individuals who can invest in me and I can invest in. This morning, can you pray with me as we come to a time of invitation? Father, I I'm thankful for the example you give us in 1 Thessalonians. The example of this horizontal discipleship relationship. Lord, I thank you that I don't have to be something great and spiritual to disciple somebody, but you call me right where I'm at to invest in other people and to allow others to invest in my life. Lord, we pray more than anything that each person in here would know God's gospel as Paul taught it to the church of Thessalonica, as as we have taught it to many here, we pray that those who do not understand or accept that gospel message would come and ask and implore, Lord, how can I know you personally? Lord, I pray for each of us to be investing in others. Make us like Paul. Make us like Timothy. Make us like Peter and John. And more than anything else, make us like Jesus Christ. Lord, help us invest in others. It's in your name we pray. Amen.